I have the great pleasure of speaking with Father Charlie Becker from the Chicago Archdiocese. And we're here in Medjugorje at the guest house of Mariana the Visionary. We just ran into each other and I would love to share his testimony with you. So here we go. Hello everyone, anyone who's listening to this testimony. Um, I'm Father Charlie Becker, I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago, and uh, I've been coming to Medjugorje for um, probably about 35 years now, some 65 trips or plus, and um, usually with groups of about 20 to 30. Um, but this is our first time back since the pandemic and all, so, um, but they're lining up quickly once again, which is good, good news. And I happened to see Father Svetozar Kralovich yesterday, which was a real encouragement um, because he's such one of the, one of those spiritual uh, grand uh, priests here of the Croatian Franciscans, uh, Father Father Svet, Father Yozo, who I haven't seen. He doesn't live in the area anymore, but but uh, there's some of these tall, you know, spiritual giants here in in Medjugorje. So, um, and I'm privileged too to know some of the Croatian friars in uh, Chicago. There's a monastery there. They're kind of United States monasteries on the south side. And um, so it's been an honor and a privilege to get to know them a little bit more too. Um, so how I, how I came to Medjugorje was um, 1989, I was three years a priest and um, there was something missing in my priesthood. I didn't know what was missing, but I was getting ready to quit actually. I, was, I always had some um, background with addictions, both uh, personally with family and then my own addiction with alcohol and uh, came to find discover recovery with that when I was in seminary um, so uh, that was always kind of a spiritual connection for me growing up both in high school with Alateen and whatnot and then ultimately with my own issues with addiction and then adult children of alcoholics issues ACOA stuff so I've always been kind of I've just it's been part of my life for all my life and uh, so I think there was kind of a little bit of a layup for me to uh, be open to Medjugorje. So three years into my priesthood, there was a family from my parish that uh, that had been here the previous year, like 87 or 88. And um, the, the, the man who um, uh, talked me into going, you know, it's really what he was trying to do is talk me into going, uh, <laughs> was working on me for a few Sundays in a row. And uh, I was reluctant to go. I mean, I was aware of some spiritual experiences in my life uh, first, the calling of my vocation, I know, was a mystical kind of moment, brief but profound, which made me think of the priesthood, which wasn't even on my radar whatsoever. I, I was in a public high school. I grew up in Catholic uh, grammar school. But back in the 70s, early 70s, and into the mid-70s, a lot of the traditional Catholic devotions and things pretty much went out the window. So I was just kind of thinking, that's the new church. So I didn't think too much about it. Didn't know that I was missing anything. Like today, people are are more uh, cognizant of you know the traditional Catholic faith and and kind of discovering that and or missing it but I didn't miss it so I was in a Chicago diocese in Chicago seminary and much of it was pretty progressive in its formation and everything so so a lot of the traditional kinds of things rosaries and adoration and I mean, we had daily mass in seminary, but you know, the, kind of the spiritual devotional life of the church from Sunday to Sunday, everything in between Sunday mass is kind of missing. And uh, so anyway, this family prevailed over, and I won't go into the whole story, even as fun <laughs> as it is. You can check my website. I have the story on my website too, which is frcharliebecker.org, so you can hear more of it. But just kind of in a nutshell, um, the family prevailed over me to come ultimately and talk me into it, and um, and I went. I really didn't see any reason to come this far for a spiritual experience. I thought if God wanted to do something, he'd just zap me in Chicago. What do I got to come all the way over here for, right? And I, I came to realize even in my own spiritual life over the years that that's why we have certain masses in honor of certain saints or we go to certain shrines because there's certain graces that are associated with that particular saint or that particular moment in the church's history or or sacrament or whatever and uh, to take it take advantage of that there's something about showing up in those places where we receive those graces i remember one example would be our lady of loretto uh in uh, uh, near ancona italy and uh, Padre Pio was asked once about 
several times about Garamandal at the time, back in the 60s. He says, I don't know about Garamandal if the Blessed Mother is appearing there or not. She says, but I know she's walking around her house in Loretto. And uh, my first experience of Loretto was probably about some, maybe 10 years ago. And uh, that's another story. There were some there were some miraculous kind of insights and awarenesses and and um, consolations that happened in that little house uh, that it's true. If you never get to Medjugorje, if you show up to her home in Loretto, the house of Loretto, you'll experience the Blessed Mother talking to you. I mean, she does, and maybe not directly. Some people hear her directly. I don't hear her directly, but I mean, there are certain thoughts or coming out of the blue that are just signs of her working in her life. And so, uh, so in, in the way of, of uh, acknowledging that ac action of hers in our life uh, occurs through, as I came to understand, which I didn't understand in the beginning, it's called consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Okay, what does that mean? See, to me, I, I had lost all of, any sense of any of that devotion. The Blue Army, the Fatima, none of that meant anything to me. So I was really dry as far as the Blessed Mother was concerned. So, so by coming here, it reignited that whole uh, spiritual journey with Our Lady. And um, there were a number of things, both in the beginning, that were um, significant little mir miraculous signs, um, reoccurring words that were given to me in my second trip here that convinced me that she was here from saying things about my life and my situation that nobody would have known and two strangers saying the exact same words within 24 hours of each other. One at the church uh, on the piazza here in Medjugorje and then again up on Cross Mountain. And Father Svet would always say, you know, there's three places of grace in Medjugorje, Apparition Hill, Cross Mountain, and the church. And it's true, you know, if we spend time in those locations, things happen. And not only in those locations, Things happen just in the streets of Medjugorje. I often liken it to like, uh, you know, if you have a sense of the Lord's presence in the tabernacle when you're adoring him. Uh, in Medjugorje, it's like there's a door open to heaven. And even just walking through the streets of Medjugorje, people, situations, things happen. We call them coincidences, you know, or people coin the phrase God incidences. It's like they happen constantly just by being in this town if you just allow yourself to be open to that reality. And um, some of them are just too coincidental to be, to, to not be God's grace working. So, uh, so those first uh, two trips <clears throat> were October 89 and then the spring of 90. And that summer, a Pentecost happened with a, the same fellow who took me to Medjugorje. We had, he started a prayer group in his living room. And wherever Our Lady is, so is the Holy Spirit, because she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit began manifesting itself in the prayer group, a rosary prayer group. It wasn't a charismatic prayer group, per se, but but Mary is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So charismatic-y type things happening, which was kind of strange to me, too. I'm like, I don't know about any of this. This is a little bit too charismatic-y for me. I was having a hard enough time getting used to the Blessed Mother, never mind the working of the Holy Spirit. But there were things that happened there, too. And once again, you can listen to my whole testimony on my website. But but it was that summer between the events of the Holy Spirit working and in the various prayer groups that I had and a, a teen prayer group. I had uh, in the, that first summer after my second trip, uh, six months after my first trip, I had like about 25 juniors and seniors in high school coming together for 15 decades of the rosary every Sunday night in the vestibule of the church. I'm like, this is really bizarre. You don't see this, you know, but the kids were drawn to the prayer from a confirmation retreat and just the silence uh, was enough for them to be want to know more. And um, so that's how a prayer group started with me with, with that age group. Then the resting in the spirit, which some of us have come across at Father Yozo uh, Zolvko, which was again, looked to channel 38 to me from the old days, uh, too charismatic, he be healed type stuff, you know. <laughs> People resting in the spirit, I didn't know how to define that, to talk about it. Uh, it made me real anxious and nervous when it starts happening. And any priest, bless the mother, says, I think she says this here in Medjugorje, not all priests have the, the gift of healing, but they could have it if they ask. Yeah. And uh, it's like, I wasn't sure I asked for I don't think I asked for it. <laughs> but when it starts happening, we just, this is if this is the way the Lord operates, who are we to second guess it? I mean... We've all been raised in the seminary with a lot of psychology and a lot of humanist, humanistic ways of, of looking at things. But um, so that began to happen that summer too. And I, 
I tried praying over the 25 kids uh, after it began happening in some of the other prayer groups, rosary groups, and sure enough, all 25 seniors and juniors fell over in the Holy Spirit on the carpeting in the vestibule of the church, all of them, without catchers. I mean, it was all new to all of us, and I was pretty freaked out. Um, and I'm leaning up against the wall, like kind of like looking suspiciously at the whole operation. And the kids saw kind of the anxiety in my way. They said, Father Charlie, is this all right? I go, I said, I think so. <laughs> I said, is it peaceful? And they said, well, yeah. I said, well, I remember learning that about mystical things in the seminary. If it's peaceful, it's from God. If it's not peaceful, it's not from God. So what Medjugorje, um, I really believe, allows us priests to open up is a sense of the mystical life, the supernatural life. We hear these things. I mean, Jesus healed people. Jesus delivered people from demonic influence. There's more and more demonic influence in people in in the lives of Americans, but uh, in a bigger way, we sometimes I sometimes see it in the Hispanic community because of bringing a lot of that up from Mexico, which is witchcraft and, and various things that that invites evil in. <clears throat> and many priests are very uncomfortable. With that. I remember even our own exorcist in Chicago, who's now an auxiliary bishop in Chicago, would say, Charlie, I appreciate that you go and bless houses that have some manifestations of evil in them. He says, at least you'll go. Most priests don't even want to get near that, mm. which is too bad because it is a part of the priestly life. It's a part of Jesus's life. Jesus comes, just his name dispels evil. And it can be at the psychological level or it can be at the mystical spiritual level. And uh, it, it, that the Lord uses us, priests, um, it, it, that's all he's asking for us is to stand in for him and to apply the prayers of the church. So like I, I'll, I came to an appreciation ultimately of the, uh, the old Roman ritual rather than the new book of blessings, huh? Because sometimes that book of blessings doesn't even bless things. It'll mention how it blesses the person who will use the thing that is being asked to be blessed but never blesses the object. And that's not our Catholic spirituality either. So, so exorcists throughout, excuse me, throughout the country also will use the old Roman ritual because it directly uh, invokes the Holy Spirit to go up against the evil spirits, evil presence. So, uh, to, so to bless a home, to exercise a home with the old Pope Leo the Thirteenth prayer, to appreciate these things. I didn't appreciate any of this when I was a newly ordained priest. I remember my pastor in the first couple of weeks asking me if I would go bless a house. I'm thinking, go bless a house. All my friends in the northwest suburbs of Chicago are CPAs and MBAs and what am I going to do, throw smoke and water at people? I mean, it, it, it just didn't fit in my worldly view, which is, unfortunately, that's just what it was. It was a worldview and not a spiritual religious view. So it wasn't until after Medjugorje that I began to see and believe and know that the Blessed Mother is really here. She, she spoke to me in various ways, maybe not verbally that I heard in my ear, uh, but through people, either people who had a gift of knowledge or people, or different uh, signs and wonders. And uh, I, w I was convinced. And from that point on, I wanted to do whatever she asked. Now, for me, at the beginning of my Medjugorje experience, that very first summer, there was a family that encouraged the people who took me to Medjugorje. If I was, they were going to start a prayer group that they should start a Marian Movement of Priests Senegal. And in the Marian Movement of Priests, to me, Medjugorje and the MMP is a godsend because it reformed my whole priestly life, really. The other uh, unapproved apparition I like to uh, extol is called the Apostolate of Holy Motherhood out of Geneva, Ohio. But the rest of it, I kind of, I kind of wear lightly. Anything else that are apparitions, and they could be true or they're not true, but it seems to me those three, in a big way, really help me with the people that I work with, mothers, first of all, family life, um, and then the priesthood. And in the Mary Movement of Priests, it's not only for priests, but it's for families and, and the laity too, but she really explains the reality that we're living through with the, the, uh, the uh, reign of Satan uh, through Freemasonry and communism and all of these things that would be hard to uh, imagine or get a handle on. She even goes through the Book of Revelation and talks about 666 and all the kinds of apocalyptic uh, wording, which I was no scripture scholar. I'm just a simple Chicago priest. I mean, I'm not uh, scripturally, theologically, we were poorly trained. We, we got Richard McBrien's theology was our foundation and not Thomas Aquinas. I mean, 
you know, in those years when you're kind of lost, you don't really dive back into it because I was never one to really study anyway. I mean, I'd rather see the movie than read the book or hear it from somebody else. But anyway, the point being is uh, uh, these these experiences spiritually, like Saint uh, Saint Louis de Montfort and uh, uh, Saint John Vianney, you know, and uh, Saint John of the Cross, who is a mystic but also a doctor. You know, we'll explain it a little bit more in depth, but we have to kind of try, especially as priests, we have to trust the Spirit's promptings. And the Blessed Mother, as the mother of Jesus, the mother of the priest, is also the mother of all of us priests. And if we let her kind of have her way with us, she will help our priesthood really come alive and, and really be about what the Lord wants us to be. Uh, not an American priest, but a priest the way Jesus wants us to be. And um, basically, it's like, Father, I, I called you to the priesthood. I asked you to get out of your lazy boy chair and apply this prayer from the Roman ritual. And then once that's applied, the Lord works. It's not even you or me working. The Lord works. And then we can go back to our easy chair and go on with our day, huh? Some of the things that she asks, too, in the Marian movement of priests, particularly for priests, to not watch the television, to not go to the movies, to not go to worldly shows. And it's just that I did. I got rid of I, I believed her so much so that she was really here in my life and for all of us that I did. I threw out the TV set. I got rid of newspapers. I mean, people say, well, how are you going to know what's going on in the world? Believe me, we know what's going on in the world. People tell us stuff. And most of what we hear in the in the media isn't accurate anyway, as we all know. So, so we allow uh, scripture, we allow the sacraments, we allow Blessed Mother's messages to form us and reform us, and and prepare us to be the priest that Jesus needs us to be. And all of a sudden, it becomes a, a true adventure. And blessing homes and chasing demons, I call it like uh, you know Ghostbusters. That's why you know I talk to the kids about it. You know, uh, what are the defenses for some of that? You know, Benedict medals, uh, blessed exercise, Benedict holy and blessed salt and water, um, you know, all of that. Warning people about, you know, staying away from yoga. You know, many priests have, we, we, we compromise and we make excuses for things that are actually kind of dangerous for folks, you know, whether it be yoga or Reiki or even Harry Potter. And people say, oh, you've taken that too seriously. It's like, no, I mean, either she's here or she's not here. And if she's here, uh, and if this is truly the Lord's church and we're truly getting direction from official church teaching on things, then, you know, we should be listening to this. Pope Benedict was real clear about Harry Potter not to watch it. Then some other underling beneath him says, oh, it's not so bad. And those who want to listen to Harry Potter, listen to that particular priest or cardinal rather than Cardinal Pope Ratzinger. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, we can all make excuses for not doing the things we want to do uh, or let our intellectual pride um, overcome or outsmart or outthink, you know, basic spiritual principles. So, uh, you know, Blessed Mother helps us stay humble, helps us to stay open to the teachings of the church authentically. Uh, Pope John Paul II, praise be God that we have the, the uh, catechism that we have. And actually, in the Mary Movement of Priest message, she says once again that that catechism came from her heart. I read the message about a couple months ago. I always thought it came from John Paul, that it was his greatest testament, which she says that's true. But the sentence just before that, she says, but it originated from her heart, the, the, the catechism. Mm -hmm. So here we have the Blessed Mother working in the church, always behind the scenes, using the priest that will listen to her to renew the church faithfully. Then, of course, you know, all the liturgical wars that are going on, we, we begin to want to pray the Mass authentically and, and reverently because we want to help people to come in, in line with the mystical. It's not about coming in line with us. It's not about the drama that sometimes we priests get carried away with. Personally, I enjoy saying the Mass ad orientum, at least at the moment of the consecration, because it keeps the focus off of us and keeps it on God the Father as we're offered the sacrifice to God the Father and it's Jesus Christ who comes to feed us. So <clears throat> all these things got put back into place, renewed my priesthood in those first few years, uh, but it's been a continual ongoing change, uh, particularly the issues with the liturgical things. We, we've seen the last you know, five to 10 years a real renewal and wanting to get closer to the sacred. And, uh, and we can do that, you know, lovingly. We wanna in, you know, in, invite people into an awareness of it that they just don't have because we've all been misformed. We've all been mistrained. We in the seminary have been mistrained. The new younger guys coming up are getting a better formation, praise God. 
Uh, I'm so grateful to God that I had, uh, I was open to the Blessed Mother in 1989 because I'm able to share and or appreciate some of what the younger priests are, are coming into. Whereas most of the priests that are my generation don't have much of an appreciation for what the younger guys are learning and you're missing it, you know, we're missing it. So God's renewing the church, uh, uh, both in the laity and the young seminarians in some powerful ways and young families, even their, their love for many of them for the Latin mass. And I'll never no learn Latin, I was terrible languages. I mean, I, mean I'm, I'm not, I won't be a Latin master guy. I tried it several times, but what it did help me do was pray the mass better, pray it more reverently, and, and, you know, encourage people to enter into the mystery a little bit better. So even by bringing back some of the devotional pieces in the Mass. So that's kind of overall. I mean, there's a lot more to how that all happened for me, the change, the conversion. You know, another thing is Blessed Mother reminds us in the Mary Movement of Priests, we priests need to be wearing our clerics all the time. In the beginning of Medjugorje, I was in my blue jeans, my nautica jacket, still smoking my cigarette. She helped me get rid of that. I mean, the drinking went some years ago, uh, but the smoking and, and even just being at peace with celibacy and my chastity and all of that came in the, after the consecration to her Immaculate Heart. And she takes us. And that consecration can be just be right from your heart. It doesn't have to be any fancy, long intellectual formula of the saints. Mine was simply this. And I always say to people, I won't end up on a holy card. Um, it's like, Blessed Mother, I am sick and tired of trying to figure out this priesthood thing by myself. <clears throat> I said, as long as I'm alive on this earth, you have it. You show me how to live it. And that was at a stop sign on my way to train in the field of addictions as I was getting ready to leave the priesthood. And uh, she took it. I mean, within the next couple of days, it was remarkable what she was doing with my with my life. And uh, I walked right into the, 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 the uh, senior counselor who said to me as I walked in her office, she said, you're leaving. I said, how did you know that? And she had received, she was kind of a 60s hippie, kind of a Catholic, uh, but a real crackerjack counselor, unbelievable with the kids. And, and uh, a priest, when she was in college, asked if he could pray over her to receive a gift of the Spirit in a, what do they call it in the charismatic, you know, baptism in the Spirit, right? And uh, she said, no, no, I don't, I don't think I would. Yeah, 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 come on, ask, think of one of the gifts of the Spirit and ask for it. I'll pray over you. So she, she thought of, okay, so she thought of knowledge. And as she prayed for knowledge, it's just what she had. When I walked into her office, she knew something. She knew exactly what was happening. And she wanted that gift because she'd have a leg up on all of the lying and deceit that teenager drug addicts do in general. And she could just nail them to the wall with honesty and truth. And she was, it was remarkable, the work. I, I, I was always enamored with how, how well she worked. So these are gifts. They're supernatural, mystical, Holy Spirit gifts. And uh, they are uncomfortable at first, initially. But, uh, but the Blessed Mother helps us to understand them, and the Lord, too, of course. Jesus helps us to understand it so that we can apply them. So that's uh, my uh, story in a nutshell. I'm grateful to God that the pandemic's over and we're starting up our trips once again, maybe two or three a year. I've gotten kind of used to life being a little slower with the pandemic, kind of enjoying it. It was a little more monastic, uh, but I'm feeling like the Blessed Mother's like kicking. Let's get going. We got lots to do. So I just met Janet for the first time today, and uh, she has a beautiful apostolate that she's been called by Our Lady in a particular way to help encourage priests to come to Medjugorje so that, you know, our priestly hearts can be renewed by the Queen of Peace and the Queen of the Clergy, our mother. So please consider being open to that, uh, that, that request of our Blessed Mother so that she can reform us and not cry over us, but rather uh, a tear of joy over, over her priest sons. So thank you, yeah. Janet. Good. Good to be with you. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much. Okay. God welcome. bless you. God bless you too. Thanks. Yeah.